today's video is going to be a little different. We're going to use a UXA spectrum analyzer to measure the magnitude, phase, and group delay of a filter. How do we do that, you ask? Well, we're going to use a vector signal generator to generate a wideband modulated signal. We're going to drive that into the filter, and then the UXA will grab the output signal and give us the characteristics based on uh, analyzing the multi-tone signal. We'll also compare that to the same measurements we get using the PNA. So, let's get started. Here's the instrument stack I'm going to use today. The VXG is on the bottom and the UXA is on the top. And I'm going to be using a filter as the test device. Here I've got the preset screen on the UXA and I'm going to uh, show we can see a little bit of signal coming from my VXG already. But we're going to switch from the uh, wideband or full band sweep uh, we'll pull down here and we'll look for that new application that's the, at the very bottom here. We see it's the channel quality, group delay. And we get a lot of choices. I'm going to choose the group delay measurement and the quad display. So that'll give me four displays. And my four displays are the spectrum, the gain phase, the gain magnitude, and the group delay. And I'll change my center frequency to the center of my filter, 5 gigahertz and uh, span out to a gigahertz of span. That's the widest span I can use on this UXA. And we can see there's already a modulated signal, but we're going to set that up exactly as I want it to be set up. So first we'll go to the signal generator, and we'll have to set the connection. And here I have a, uh, a, a computer name, and I can make the connection, and it shows up the uh, VXG information. And I can do things like change the frequency of the VXG or change the amplitude, change the amplitude to plus 10, and I can send those settings over to the signal generator. And we'll close that. And next we'll look at the tone settings. I want an 800 megahertz span, so I'm going to set 801 tones, and each tone will be 1 megahertz apart. And that will give me a wideband signal to drive my device under test. And then I'll configure the tones. And to configure the tones, we're going to use random phase. You have lots of choices here. And we'll use a random seed that's fixed at uh, zero point. And we can see that if I hit apply fill, all the phases gets filled in for all the 801 points. I'll need to do that because there were only 64 uh, tones before. And now I can apply those to the signal generator. Notice that the measurement range is only 768 because we lose a little bit on either end due to the group delay aperture. And now it tells me that it's sending that waveform file over to the signal generator to set up the tones. And we can close this setting up. And now we'll see the wideband signal that I've set. We can see the gain magnitude. It has a little bit of ripple. The phase or gain phase also has some ripple on it. And the group delay is pretty flat, but if we scaled that up, we would see that it also has some ripple on it. We can get rid of the ripple by doing a kind of calibration. So we say do calibration, and it'll start by measuring the tones that it sees in the receiver, and then creating a calibration file that compensates them so that the new measured values will be compensated by any gain amplitude or phase deviation that we're going to see. When it's finished, we can see in the table how much amplitude and phase correction it's applied. And now when we close up, we see that the uh, magnitude response is perfectly flat, the phase response is perfectly flat, and also the group delay response is flat. Let me note that I did the calibration step with a small through adapter uh, in line with two attenuators. I put one attenuator at the end of the cable from the VXG and another attenuator, a 6 dB attenuator, on the cable going from the uh, device interface to the UXA. That's because we can't do mismatch correction with this and the filter has not great match and so we'll get mismatch ripple if I don't have a really good matched response and this removes or reduces the effect of mismatch in the cable and the VXG source and in the cable going to the UXA receiver. 
And now I connect my filter in between the two attenuators and I'll make some measurements. And here I'll restart my measurement. And we can see in the spectrum plot immediately the filter shape. I'll note that the uh, uh, gain magnitude shows up. Uh, we can rescale it to look at something like 5 or even uh, 2 dB per division. Uh, jump that down a little lower. And we can see the filter response. Of course, we only see the response over the modulated signal bandwidth. And here you can see the phase response of the filter. And if I go down to the group delay, the filter's not that long, so we can go and auto scale the group delay or set the scale something like one nanosecond per division. And here I'm going to use the marker settings to change where the marker is located. So the normal mode is fine, but I'll want that marker to be on the gain phase plot. We say gain phase because it's really input versus output instead of absolute phase, and we can choose other marker settings. So we'll slide this marker up to the peak of the signal. We can use the peak search to find it. And we see about 19.7 degrees and then I can use another marker to put it at the minimum of the signal and get the peak to peak deviation across the this portion of the bandwidth of the filter so I go back to the marker settings and I can choose marker 2 do the same thing where I set it on the gain phase measurement and turn the marker on and move it to the minimum spot so I can record those two values, the 19.75 and the 14.3, or minus 14.3. So now I know the two values of the peak deviation. Let's switch over to a measurement I did on the PNA. This is the amplitude response. And uh, we can see it's pretty flat, has similar shape. But let's jump over to the phase response. And on the PNA, we have a math function called uh, trace deviation. It's doing the same thing that the UXA is doing, getting the uh, deviation from linear phase. And if I put the markers there, I see 19.95, practically the same number. And I can put a second marker uh, on the, drag it over to the minimum. And if I look at the bottom of the trace, 14.23. So here you can see I get practically the same answers with the VNA measurement as I do with the UXA uh, channel quality and group delay measurement. And for completeness, I can turn on marker 3 and marker 4, uh, switch those to the normal mode, and choose the group delay trace. You get the uh, group delay peaks on either side. That's often an important criteria in making filter measurements. And I've got two of my markers on now. Close it up and take a look at where we put them. Okay, here I've put marker 4 kind of on the minimum spot of the group delay. It's about 0.38, nanose 0.38 nanoseconds, and I move marker 3 to the peak. It's about uh, 1.5, uh, 6 nanoseconds. So I've got a little over 1.94 nanoseconds peak to peak. I notice there's two colored traces. Let's go look at the trace dialog, and we can see what we have here. We have the instantaneous trace, and then we also have an average trace, which will... Uh, do a 25 averaging as I've got it set now. And if I turn the averaging trace off and uh, if I trigger a measurement, we'll see that this jumps around a bit. It has maybe a tiny little spur that's jumping up and down and causing a little bit of ripple. But uh, I can always average any of these traces by turning the averaging trace on and looking at that data instead. So here I'll turn off the, turn on the averaging trace, turn off the instantaneous trace, and now my readings are much smoother because we're averaging about 25 times. Let me take just a moment to talk about the group delay aperture. The aperture is the span over which we do the uh, math of delta phase over delta frequency. Here I'm closing or opening up the aperture to 10%. We see we get a smoother result uh, when we do that, although we do lose a, big, a little bit more at the beginning and the end of the 800 megahertz band. And if I change the aperture back to a very narrow aperture, a 1%, uh, any deviation or noise in the phase trace will show up a lot more in this trace, although as we average down, it averages away 
you see a little fine grain ripple associated almost surely with the mismatch between the filter and the test system. And here I've switched to the PNA measurement and you can see I get almost the same result 1.92 nanoseconds from uh, min to max although the group delay is a bit smoother here. And finally I can save all this away. If I save I can either do a picture save or I can save the measurement data and save that data off to some file. And there are some other measurements we can uh, pull down here and see in the setup we have a, also a choice of a 3 by 2 display. And the 3 by 2 display gives us a, a couple of more parameters. The RF envelope, uh, the instantaneous envelope is often interesting to look at. And then we have the group delay or metrics which gives us some things like we can see the source and receiver off a little bit, 575 hertz off. They're not locked to each other. We can see some of the group delay numbers, the RMS group delay, the uh, peak and uh, or min and max, and then uh, peak to peak by two. So we double that number to get the peak to peak group delay. Here I'll switch the instantaneous trace on. And here I have the IQ waveform, similar to the RF envelope. Uh, I can also change to something called phase only. So this is the absolute phase of the tone, and we know it was a random phase, so you can see the random phase signals. And if you look at the RF envelope uh, signal, that's the random phase there. And the RF envelope signal looks quite random. Now, we can change our measurement setup to not make it a random phase. It doesn't have to be go to the tone settings and uh, reconfigure the tones to be a parabolic phase. And if I reconfigure them and then I can apply them, it'll download the new phase. And the phase now shows us the tone phase and it, if we look at the phase here, we see that it is a parabolic phase that we're expecting to see. But remember, this is just changing the reference phase or the phase that the spectrum analyzer is expecting to see. Same thing with the amplitude. We can see the group delay, which is always a gain measurement. Is it really the right answer? Because we haven't yet applied the signals to the uh, signal generator. So when I apply it, now it downloads that new phase. And uh, it'll take a while to download it. But after it does, then when we restart the measurement, we'll see that the group delay now uses that new set of phases. So here we've restarted. And I can also go back to the gain phase and show the gain phase is really unchanged because it doesn't depend uh, to the first order on what phases we actually use. But of course the group delay to do the proper measurement we have to have uh, a knowledge of what the input phases are and then what our measurement phases are and that's what we have. And here we can see with the chirp signal or the parabolic phase we can see the RF envelope drops uh, each cycle as it retraces its uh, frequency response. All right, so now we've finished our demo. Uh, you can see that we can do a really good job of measuring the uh, group delay response, the magnitude and phase response of a filter, or anything else uh, using the new channel quality group delay X apps on the UXA. Thanks for watching.